Hello, sensitive souls. Mark Normand is a stand-up comedian who is currently touring the country on a theater tour. That tour just so happens to be stopping in Austin for Moon Tower Comedy Festival. You can go to MoonTowerComedyFest.com to get tickets for his April 20th show at the Paramount Theater. Also, make sure to check out his website at MarkNormandComedy.com. Mark, thank you for the time. How are you doing today? Hey. So, Mark, how you doing today? Good, good. What's shaking? Not a lot, man. Thank you so much for the time. I'm a big fan of your comedy and uh, looking forward to checking out the show next week. Oh, hey, you're the one. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm terrified. I have no idea how tickets are selling. Um, I think that if nothing else, there's a decent out-of-town appeal, but that's part of the reason why I guess you're talking to me right now. We're trying to get more Austinites to these shows. People... I think people are starting to realize, Mark, that Austin is about to become a stand-up comedy epicenter if it's not already there just yet. Yeah, I was going to say about to. You just you got more comedy clubs than than Chicago. Yeah, and Rogan's obviously going to be opening his place soon. Helium yeah. reopening Cap City. It is an exciting time to uh, perform comedy and to be a lover of comedy in this town. You've actually uh, been a frequent guest of this town to perform stand-up over the last couple of years. What is it that you love about performing in Austin? Well, uh, Austin's great because you get the uh, the young, full of life vibe, and also nobody's uh, upset at you vibe. You know. Like you get the the young smart crowds who also don't get offended because I guess you got you got young college people meet Texas and that's a fun <laughs> juxtaposition there. Uh, also, I did I did a show there like a week ago at the Vulcan. Yep. And then we walked over to the creek just to mess around. That was packed. And then we went to somewhere else I forgot the name of. And that was packed. And I'm like, how many people live in this goddamn town? Was the third place the Velveeta Room? Out of curiosity. No, no, I know that one. It was it was a newish one that I that has popped up later that I hadn't heard of. But then there's like the Sunset City or Sunset Strip Club. Sunset Strip. Uh, there's all yeah. these. Yeah, it, it it never ends. And then Cap City's opening too. So it's like, I hope it can sustain. But uh, it's, it seems like a lot. But every room was full. So your Moon Tower show on 420 is at the Paramount, but the Vulcan is such a fascinating place to see comedy. I don't know if you're familiar with the 1980s flick Cocktail, but it's like watching stand-up comedy <laughs> in that highfalutin bar that they opened up at one point. But it freaking works, man. Are, are you a fan of getting to perform with Rogan at Al at uh, Vulcan? Sure, sure. I mean, he's got his people. It's a different, it's a different audience, you know, but they, they definitely don't get upset. Uh, they love comedy. They like it a little, little darker, if you know what I mean. And uh, I'm all for that. That's what those yonder pouches are for, so that nobody can tattletale on you guys when it's all said and done. Now, you are doing the 420 show here for Moon Tower. I assume that you're going to run through your normal act, uh, as you have been doing at these theater tours uh, across the country over the last couple of months. You're not going to be punching it up Doug Benson style or anything, right? No, no, no. I got a, I got a hot hour cooking. And uh, I'm excited. I love that room, that Paramount. I did four or five shows there last year, but it was COVID restricted. So this will be packed out and I got a new set and it's dark. It's queefy. It's dirty. It's gay. I think for all those reasons and also your demeanor, I've always falsely assumed as you, uh, you as a Canadian uh, Ah. of origin, but you're actually a New Orleans guy to begin with. I'm curious yeah. to know what New Orleans qualities still stick with you all these years later, even though you do identify as a New Yorker now. Well, I uh, I never got the Canadian thing. I'm a little hurt. It's funny if you call like a Chinese guy, if you call him Japanese, you're like, what are you racist? But we don't do that with American and Canadian for some reason. But the whole thing sucks. Either way, uh, New Orleans, I still drink heavily. I'm a little hungover now and uh, stay out late. And I like Cajun food, um, but I guess that's about it. I did. I got up and got out of that town. I went to Mardi Gras, New Orleans for six or seven straight years. And by the end of that run, I was exhausted. I can only imagine growing up there, just uh, some of the crazy shit that you see, uh, even as a preteen, just uh, celebrating that Ooh. time of year. 
Not a great place to grow up. I'll say that. I mean, look, we partied. I went to the French Quarter as a kid. I would watch the ball drop on Bourbon Street, all that shit. Jazz Fest. But it, growing up in New Orleans, it's too fun. It And there's not enough structure. Like, I always say it's like having a dad who's a drug dealer. All your friends think it's cool, but you every now and then you need a vegetable and a ride to school. <laughs> you know, you still need a hug every now and then. Do you uh, enjoy going back and performing there now, even though you're obviously not living there anymore? I don't. Uh, it's a look. It's a great city. There's a lot of great people who live there, but it's not a comedy savvy town. Mm. And if I do a show, I got to just suck it up because I know all my jerk off high school buddies are going to come out there and give me in a headlock and eight people are going to get hammered and heckle me about our, our third grade teacher. So that part sucks. Uh, you guys are having to be on your toes now after what happened at the Oscars a couple weeks ago with uh, Will Smith uh, <laughs> breaking the cuck mold to uh, go and slap Chris Wa uh, Rock after a, a pretty pedestrian joke. Uh, have you ever had to deal with somebody trying to come on stage to come after you for saying something what they consider to be offensive? I have, actually. Uh, usually a bouncer will step in or something will happen, but... Uh... One time, this guy in the front row was just chirping at me, like, you suck, kill yourself, quit comedy. What made you think you could do this? And no one else could hear it, but he was in the front row just saying it up at me, just quietly. And it was, like, needling at my brain. Like, ah, this guy's getting to me. And then eventually I just snapped and went off on the guy. And all the rest of the crowd turned on me. He's like, well, where'd that come from? Because they couldn't hear him. Right. So I was just drilling into this guy. I lost. I saw red. And uh, he he eventually started coming up onto the stage. And before he could get all the way up, I kicked him like in the stomach. And that, that pushed him back a little bit. And then they grabbed him. Well, you kicked the guy in the stomach. I don't know if I have the wherewithal to go for a straight kick to the stomach, Rogan style. Well, I had a little elevation because you have to step up to the stage. So I knew I had a I had a down kick on him. Plus, I didn't want to I don't want him to get too close. So I felt like a kick would keep him further away. Yeah, just in you case punch. he had, just in case he had the longer wingspan than you, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. So I feel like a nice sidekick could really keep him at bay. Did you get into a bunch of fights as a kid in New Orleans, or did you stay away from those? Well, I went to public school. I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood, so uh, I wouldn't say I got into a bunch of fights, but I got beat up a lot. <laughs> one side of the fair, huh? one, yeah. one side of the fair, huh? Exactly. Okay. I won right. one. How'd you win that one? Did you catch him I, off guard? Yeah, I guess so. I kind of sucker kicked him. I'm a <laughs> kicker. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. So uh, what do you think of the state of comedy in 2022? Obviously, there are landmines that exist that didn't 5, 10, 15 years ago. But it feels like if you're authentic to yourself and if uh, deep down the point that you're trying to make isn't outright hateful, you're still able to get away with a lot and not have to apologize in the process. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's it's a there's a lot going on with this shit now, like a lot of spinning plates. You know, some people want to get you in trouble just so they get clout and they get clicks and actually care about racism uh, some people actually do care about racism and, and are actually trying to reach out. Like I've had emails like, Hey, I'm Muslim. That joke offended me, which that I'll take. Cause I'm like, you're not trying to ruin my life. You actually just want to make it better, which to me is more, more decent. Some people just want to ruin your life. So they get the, the, the credit. But I think, uh, if it's a joke and if it gets a big laugh, you I think you can joke about anything. It's just gotta get a laugh. Now, the problem is to get a dark joke to get a laugh, you have to fuck it up and, and fumble a few times and not get a laugh and bomb. And you look like the biggest piece of shit on the planet because you're joking about baby rape and it wasn't funny. But you're like, it will be funny. You just got to let me find the, the, the punchline. So that's where the rubber meets the road. That's why we bag up the phones. It's because we're not worried you're, you're going to get mad at the dark shit. We're worried you're going to be mad at the dark shit that's not ready yet. But the only way to get it ready is to try it out in front of people. So that's the hard part. What's your response when somebody does reach out to you individually to say, hey, hey, this hurt me? Has that forced you to reconsider the way that you're framing a joke or even talking about something altogether? Never talking about something altogether, because to me, it's all it's all open. But uh, it has like people go, hey, I'm 
I'm a, a queer or whatever. And you actually had these, these facts wrong. And I'm like, Oh, and then I'll Google it. And I was wrong. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you. I don't want to be the, uh, the guy with the ignorant shit. I'm, I'm fine being transphobic or racist or whatever, like jokingly, but I just don't want to have my shit incorrect. So uh, that stuff helps. And I, I welcome it. I'd rather have a dialogue. I don't want to hurt anybody, but people say, why do you make jokes about race? I'm like, cause race exists. It's just, you know, I have jokes about toothbrushes. Toothbrush. You think I give a shit about toothbrushes? No, they just exist. It's it's just fodder for for jokes. So, if you come to me with some kind of uh, some helpful structure, what do you call it? Uh, constructive criticism. I'm all for it. There you go. If you call that- me a homo, then I'm like, where are we going here? Well, that dialogue is important, and unfortunately, it seems to be disappearing in modern times. That's why it's uh, crucial for those of us who are capable of it to try and engage, to try and understand that other side, because there are different ideologies on things, Mark. Some people believe that you shouldn't joke or have fun with any serious subject. There has been some negativity in the past, but I'm this way. I feel like you're this way as well. Like The only way we can truly come together is to be able to laugh at our differences. I agree. I agree. A friend of mine, she's a big, giant, fat lady comedian. And that's like her whole act, really. And we did a show once and it was like on the wall. It said no jokes about being fat. And she was like, well, that's my whole act, you know. So she's like, that probably doesn't apply to me because I'm making jokes about myself. And they were like, no, no, you can't do that. And so she she left. And was you're it like, Pat? No, no, it was it was Miss Fat. But no, no, it was a uh, comic in, in Brooklyn, but like, gotcha. That's how she deals with it, you know? And it's like, you're going to tell her what you can't talk about. That's to me, that's insane. That's, that's like saying to a black guy, like, Hey, you can't say the N word. It's, it's a little uh, jarring for people or whatever. And you're like, who's the good, you're the good guy here. What, what are you crazy? Uh, so there's shit like that where we just go too far. Well, plus, as far as the fat thing goes, if I'm remembering correctly from one of your comedy specials, you, like me, were a fat kid. So that gives you access to uh, more fat jokes than the average person. Right. Which, again, is the only group you can do that with. You can't be like, hey, hey, I used to be Mexican. But yeah. Um, Well, just 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 give it a couple of years, Mark. (laughs) I can get pretty tan and I'm not that tall. So maybe you got something here. Plus, but, at, this, uh, at this point, if you want to identify as just about anything, you can. You can get away with it. That's true. That's true. Yeah. It's a it's a kooky time, and it's weird. When the times are kookier, you should make more jokes about it, but people get mad about the jokes, so now we're all going crazy. Yeah, no doubt about that. Uh, as far as being a fat kid goes, what allowed you to uh, get a grip on things? For me, it was my grandparents telling me that I got fat and then I did ultra slim fast over the course of a summer between my sophomore and junior years, thankfully. <laughs> For me, that's wow. For me, it's a uh, puberty kicked in and I, it kind of started melting off me. Thank God. But those were tough, tough formative years because that was in the 90s when you could just trash somebody openly for being fat and it was like completely accepted. Plus, it feels terrible having to run in elementary school for gym yes. class and not being able to get your arms all the way down because the arm fit fat, you know? <laughs> totally, totally. Been there. A lot of chafing. A lot of chafing indeed. All right, Mark, uh, anything else before I let you go? It's uh, the, the, the show is April 20th. Moon Tower Comedy Fest is where people can get the tickets. They also need to go to marknormandcomedy.com to find out all your tour dates, a bunch of cool info. Also can get a link to the podcast there. Uh, anything else you'd like people to know about your, uh, your stop in Austin next week? Hey, uh, it's going to be new material. It's a hot show. It's really cooking right now. And I'll, I'll do a, I'm doing a Q&A at the end, which has really been uh, fun for the audience. They just throw out like Down Syndrome Victoria's Secret model and we go off on that and we go off on abortion. We go off on whatever. So yeah, looking forward to it. It's going to be a hot show. We're filming the whole thing uh, for my for my socials and YouTube. So come on by, folks. This isn't going to be some, some queef doing workout material. It's a hot set. Well, now I have to ask. Down Syndrome Victoria's Secret model. <laughs> in jail now it's like inclusive that's right we're, times. we're changing the term for pedophile now it's got to be something that's much <laughs> more politically correct right right i think the term is uh spacey all right that's an old reference 
Uh, Mar- Mark, Mark okay. thank you so much for the time today, man. Thank you, sir. Have a good one. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thank you to Joshua Bates for the video editing. Go to Forager Digital on Instagram to get a hold of Josh if you have some video editing needs. And as always, we do appreciate you checking us out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.